for inviting me. The Bible is already in the program, so why read it at all? <laughs> and the fact that you have invited me must suggest that I qualify to address you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let me say how glad I am to be present with you this morning. I've put together notes which will be availed to you, which speak in detail to the subject that you invited me to speak about. So what I'll do during this engagement is not to give you a typical keynote, but simply to, in a, an eclectic fashion, speak to some of the key issues that I think are relevant to an engagement such as this, and sensitive to the fact that your overall theme is about climate change. It is important to note what the world has been doing about climate change for a long time now. And those of you who are involved in the area of survey will remember that the world started worrying about the climate as early as 1972. And you will only have to read the agreement on the environment in Stockholm in 1972. After Stockholm, there have been a series of iconic meetings which have also spoken to the question of climate, you remember Rio 1992. You will remember Kyoto in 1997, which of course came into force in the year 2005. You'll remember Paris in 2015, 2016. And uh, of course, you'll also remember the series of the conference on parties of the UN Confer uh, Framework Contract on uh, or rather Framework Convention on Climate Change, the last of which was held, I believe, early this year in Sham el Sheikh in Egypt, and the 28th, which will be held in the United Arab Emirates in the month of November 2023. Within the African continent, we have also seen those developments. If you look at Africa Agenda 2063, which came into being in the year 2013, you will see that there is, in fact, an Africa framework on climate change and resilience strategy, which covers the year 2022 and will be in force up to the year 2032. And within the international arena, of course, we are aware of the Sustainable Development Goal number 13, which speaks to climate change. So that the whole question of climate is one that has been with us. I was listening to the Secretary General of the United Nations just a few days ago, and he was talking about the boiling world, that the world has now reached a boiling point. And you only have to see the temperatures which are very extreme. If you look at the floods, only yesterday, Beijing, China, had rain of nearly one meter. And if you look at what is happening in terms of the heat, Mongolia recorded its highest temperature since they started doing the records. And so that this is an issue that is alive and real. Of course, that is not to say that we do not have climate change skeptics, people who believe that really this is just fiction. But if you look at the El Nino and La Nina phenomena, that we have seen in the world in the recent past, it tells you that something is happening to the world. And it is in that context, therefore, that we must talk about a resilient leadership. And when one talks about leadership at any level, one must recognize, particularly when one is talking about these issues in the context of Africa, Africa is a continent that has a very large desert, the desert area and the unraveling of the Sahara Desert. Those of you who are keen students of geography will note, for example, that the Lake Chad Basin, the Lake Chad contracted by almost over 30%. And you can imagine the impact that it has had in, on the Chad Basin, the fishing communities, and if you go down south in the Namib Desert, 
And if you look at quite a number of areas which have marginal land, the world is really going through a very difficult phase. We then calls into question, what are we doing at the level of leadership, at the level of research? If you look at Africa today, and you look at the kind of money that we deploy into research is less than 0.25% of our budgets, not our GDP. And if you look at the world now, if you look at researchers per million, you'll be shocked at how pathetic we are. Israel leads the world, and I think to one million Israel has nearly anything between 6,500 to 6,980 researchers per million. If you come to Africa, you come to countries, I think South Africa is leading in this regard with about 500 researchers per million, Kenya possibly two, 250. Nigeria, which should be leading in this regard, is below 100. And if you don't research, then you are engaged in voodoo because Science has now demonstrated that there must be logic to what we are doing. And even those who are in positions of leadership must be individuals who are dictated and governed by science. And Africa has been going through a series of factors and a series of agreements over the year. I remember uh, that when Africa, for example, the Africans sat in Lagos in 1980 and came up with the Lagos Plan of Action, which was to be the blueprint of how Africa was going to develop in all spheres. The Lagos, the Lagos Plan of Action came and was never implemented. And if you look at many of the promises that we have made to ourselves, the question that then arises is why have we not fulfilled those uh, promises that we have made to ourselves? And I'll just run through quite a number of them in order to situate them in the context of what leadership is all about. If you look at the freeing of the, of, of, of the spaces, of the, of the airspace, for example, as early as 1988 in Yamasukuru, La Côte d'Ivoire, Africa said we were going to free the airspace to reduce the cost of airfare within the continent of Africa. We have not fulfilled it. In Kenya, only yesterday, I think we have now allowed Ethiopian airline and Air Dubai to fly directly into Mombasa, their second aircraft. But Kenya Airways, of course, objects because it is competition. And I'm saying, why don't we achieve this? Because there is no shortage of declaration that we have made. If we had implemented Yamasukuru, you can imagine what would be happening in terms of trade. And I'm saying that is the quality of leadership that follows these things through that is lacking. If you go into the area of, uh, of medicine, for example, in Abuja in the year 2001, Africans met and said that we were going to spend 15% of our budget, not GDP, in health. None of the countries reached. I think it is only Mauritius and, and, and Rwanda that nearly succeeded in doing so. And you can see the health burden and the diseases, some of the diseases that we thought we had conquered are now coming back. And if you go into the area of agriculture, we have not dealt with agriculture. I think that is the Malabo Convention on Agriculture. You go on the question of involvement of women into the affairs of the government, the Maputo Declaration, you go into the much more recent Malabo Declaration on Unconstitutional Changes of Government 2022, and you can see how governments are changing unconstitutionally in the western part of Africa. Why do I say this? I say this because we are talking about resilient leadership. And you are leaders in your own right. When you come into the arena of survey, I was asking the CEO when I was coming here, what percentage of Kenyan land is properly surveyed? Leave alone those, those things that you are using chains to survey. Properly surveyed. And I dare say, and she said, that is not more than 30%. In the 21st century, and Kenya is one of the better countries. If you ask our rivers, have they been properly surveyed? The answer is no. If you ask 
both our territorial on our on, on, on the farmer terra on the land, the kind of survey, the land tenure systems that we have here. And we have some of the most convoluted tenure systems in this continent. If you go to Western Africa, you'll find Western and Central Africa, you have ancestral land. If you go to Uganda, they still are grappling with Mairo land. And, and the tenure systems in the Baganda Kingdom, in the Bunyoro Kitara Kingdom, in the Toroem, is totally different from the tenure system that you'll find in Jinja, for example, or Kampala, for example. And when you are getting into survey, there are cultural issues that stand in your way. When we were doing the constitution, you'll remember that some of the things that we grappled with was whether we should have communal tenure systems for forest dwellers like the Ogiek, for example. Uh, the, uh, my good friend here talked about the Kaya, the traditional issues. How do you deal with them? Oh, you talked about Dongo Kundu. And all these issues that we are dealing with are standing in the way of our realization of the fuller potential of the utilization of land. Because land is a major factor of production. And if that major factor of production is not dealt with in a manner that is modern or accommodative of the modern realities, then the development that we talk about is hampered in many ways. And once again, one may ask, how does leadership and resilience come into play? And I'll be able to contextualize. You are surveyors, you are land valuers, and you have all the professions that are present here under your umbrella body. Where is the original sin that we are committing? The original sin is at the level of training. How are we training people at our universities and institutions of learning? If you go to many African universities, if you go to the universities in this country that train uh, people in the survey department, the equipment is as old as when I was at the university, which is over 30 years ago. In other words, you are using things that are completely outmoded, competing with the Koreans who have gone into the realm of technology. You are competing with the Chinese, you are competing with the Europeans, you are competing, these are the people that you are competing with. If you look at current developments, for example, in an area that is uh, germane or relevant to your own profession, look at the infrastructure that is being undertaken by the Chinese across the continent of Africa. How are you involved? When they were doing the expressway, in Nairobi, how many of you were involved? Was your association involved? Were Kenyan engineers involved? Were Kenyan valuers involved? No. You are busy dealing with petty stuff, eating the crumbs while the dinner is on the table. This is the situation in which you find yourselves. And that is not only true of Kenya, it is true in all countries. I'm told they are my friends here from, uh, uh, from uh, Nigeria. If you go to the development that are taking place in Abuja, who is doing the work? If you go to the beautiful road that are found in Akwai Bomb, in, in, in Uyo, in Akwai Bomb, who is doing the roads? If you go to the road that are being done in Lagos, if you go to the railway that is being done in between Addis and Djibouti, if you go to the road that is being done between Hargeisa and Barbara, who is doing them? If you go to the developments taking place in Juba or the development taking place in Kinshasa or in Botswana, who is doing them? It is not you African professionals. What you African professionals and we African professionals are doing, we are engaged in little surveys in rural Kenya or rural Africa, planting beacons. This is what we are doing. In other words, we are not playing in the big league. And if we are not playing in the big league, what it means is that we are not controlling our development. Today, if I ask you surveyors, particularly this institution, who should know? the location of the fiber optic that runs subterraneanly in the Indian Ocean. You do not know. You have no idea. If I were to ask those who are here in Mombasa, 
where the cables in respect of all these things are running, you do not know. In other words, we are not in control. And if you are not in control, you cannot determine the agenda. Today, and my good friend, the lecturer there, will be talking about artificial intelligence. We are now in the realm, she'll tell you, we are now in the realm of the fourth industrial revolution, segueing into the fifth industrial revolution. Those of you who are training now as surveyors and land valuers, we are going to have equipment which will take care of the work that a hundred of you are doing. In other words, in the next 10 years, you'll be irrelevant. You'll be dinosaurs. Your training will have no meaning. And the question is, how do you make sure that you remain relevant? Because we are going to bring in equipment here which we do not make. You know, sometimes when I hear computer scientists in Africa saying, I'm a computer guru, I say, which guru? Which guru are you? Because whose computer are you using? says I'm an expert on the internet. Whose internet? I'm an expert on cloud computing. Whose cloud? You are not in control. You can be switched off like this. Until the day that we are in charge, somebody says I have a Twitter account, I have a WhatsApp account, which is encrypted from end to Who has encrypted it? That you have so much faith in it. I'm on Instagram. I'm on YouTube, Uber, being controlled from San Francisco in the United States of America, Bolt, being controlled from Estonia. Leadership is about agility. In my younger life, until now, I'm a martial artist. And one of the greatest martial artists and philosophers is Bruce Lee with his art called Jude Kunedu. And he says that a leader must be agile like a martial artist. Agile like water. If it is in a glass, it takes the shape of, water, of the glass. If it is in a bottle, it takes the shape of a bottle, but it doesn't change. It can be solid, it can be gas, it can be liquid, but it's still water. Leadership. A leader must have vision. You've got to see the big picture. Do we have such leaders? Whether it's in the political arena, you are typical African so-called leader. I don't use leader when I'm talking about African politics. Because it's an insult to the word. <laughs> Their agenda is thinking from one election to the other. No big ideas. You go to China, see big thinking. The Chinese are now thinking about how they will relate to Africa a hundred years from today. hundred years from today. None of us will be alive. None of them will be alive. That is why they have, you go to any serious university in Africa now, they have a Confucius Institute. They are here to take charge of your mind so that you begin thinking like Chinese. They are teaching your children, you of the middle class, your children, you now tell them, learn English and learn Mandarin. Because they are creating leaders in their own image. You know, when there was the conference in Shamil Sheikh, the cops, 27, Nigeria had the largest delegation with 486 or thereabouts followed by Kenya with 386 for thereabouts. China had 193 or thereabouts. The United States 186 or thereabouts. Half of the individuals from Nigerian and Kenyan delegation were dead weight who were shopping in Shamil Sheikh. They had no idea what was happening. So when they come, they are now waiting for the conference in United Arab Emirates on 23rd to 25th November this year. Yet some individual in some ministry in this country authorized that they go. 
and all of them possibly were traveling business class. Those are not leaders. Those are thieves. And when you have such individuals controlling your affairs, you can't go far. We consume technology in a very primitive way without context. There is something called Ardi Sasa. Good. I started trying to enroll in it yesterday. I have not succeeded. Because they send me a pin when I put it in, they say I'm too late and I've done it immediately. Now what about my semi-literate mother and grandmother in rural Africa? How are they going to consume Ardi Sasa? Good on paper, but out of context. Every technology must be contextualized so that it has real meaning. Today, if you are borrowing money from a bank and you want to use that money quickly, Registering a document in the land registry in this country is a nightmare. And yet, you hear those in those sectors saying, we are ticking the box, we are now technologically savvy, we have heard this as a nonsense. <laughs> if it doesn't work, it is complete nonsense. We should not be in the business of ticking boxes and feeling good. If you go to countries where these things are done, you can do it in the comfort of your sitting room. Let us consume technology in a manner that is within context. And you who are surveying, land is a very emotive issue. You know, you go to Kisumu, you go to Thika, you go to Kitengela, you go to Kilifi, see the many land conflicts that are there, double registration of land. How did that happen when you leaders were there? How? How did that happen when you have ethical standards within the survey and land valuation? How does it happen that a single piece of land is valued by four surveyors and one says it is two million, another one says it's 30 million, another one says it is 40 million? Is it voodoo or science? <laughs> and we do this when the government is required to steal money through professionalism, you call it. Is that leadership? Leadership is about honesty. That is the point that I'm trying to make. That you are not a leader until you are honest. Leadership is about courage. And courage does not mean recklessness. It's about doing the right thing in a manner that is orderly. Are we courageous? Are you prepared to speak your mind without fear of consequence? He's lucky that you don't have the minister in charge here. If he was here, many of you here would be groveling, Mr. C.S., Mr. C.S. That's what we do in Africa. We see public officials and we go on a worship mode. <laughs> and we don't tell them the truth. So somebody who is a C.S., somebody who is a P.S., is being worshipped and you claim you are a leader. He's talking about the Kenya port, so the port of Mombasa. The port of Mombasa is losing as we speak to Dar es Salaam, and he knows it. Losing to Dar es Salaam. Rwanda is preferring Dar es Salaam. Uganda is preferring Dar es Salaam. Eastern Congo is preferring Dar es Salaam. Burundi is preferring Dar es Salaam. Why? The question is, there is something that we are not doing. The leadership is not doing something. And the leadership must be told. And why should we be worried as Kenyans? Because if the port of Mombasa loses out to Dar es Salaam, it means that jobs will be lost here. It means that the cost of goods will be lost here. Right now, you know that the port of Barbara in, in Somaliland is being done. When the port of Barbara is finished, when Port Sudan is operating at full throttle, when Djibouti is operating at full throttle, when Beira is operating at full throttle, when Bagamoyo and Tanga is operating at full throttle, I fear for my port. 
I fear for my port and therefore my country. So one of the things that leadership in East Africa should be thinking about, and I know they are, because I've looked at their plan, is an integrated African approach, East African approach, so that there is no negative competition between Mombasa and Bagamoyo or any other port or the inland port that we are now doing in Kisumu, in Kindu Bay, in Fort Portal, in Mwanza and all those. And all this is about leadership. Leadership is about foresight and intergenerational. When you are a leader, you don't think about today. The things that you are doing today, the fruits will be born long after you are gone. That is why it's always said that you are never successful until your successor succeeds. This is it. Leadership is about empathy, about building a team. I was telling some young men that one of the things that amazes me and annoys me at once is when African countries go for team sports. Right now, there is the women's football in New Zealand and Australia. And when African countries score a goal, and lose. The newspapers in Africa report that the African team has done very well. They scored a goal. But I thought people went there to win. When an African team reaches the quarterfinals of the World Cup, we say, oh great, for the first time an African team has reached the quarterfinal. You would think that the African teams were human beings playing with angels. What point am I trying to make? A good leader creates a team, a champion team. And a champion team will always beat a team of champions. A team of champions is a group of individuals who all have talent but are each playing for their personal glory. That is why in Africa you see Africans only do well in individual sports, not in team sports. Kukimbia tu hivi. Walashinda hivi. Kwa one, one, one man's glory. Anakimbia kabisa, tunavunja marekodi, kabisa. Lakini kuja kwa kandanda, abas. Kuja kwa kandanda, hatuko. Kuja kwa netball, hatuko. Kuja kwa mpira wa kikapu, hatuko. Team sport, hatuko. Why? Because we are not a champion team. A good leader must build a team where there is delegation without abdication. A good leader delegates but does not abdicate and says the back stops with me. A good leader encourages those who are serving under him or her, does not feel threatened. A good leader has high self-esteem. No, I'm to him. No self-esteem when, when a worker is doing a good job and a kasirika. And attack a sifa hivi. And attack a sifiwe. And attack a wamuabudu. Yo si kiongozi. Yo ni muhuni too. So, when we are in a forum such as this, and, and as I worry about this continent, Chinua Achebe, writing in his book, The Trouble with Nigeria in 1983, says something that applies across Africa. He says of Nigeria, and I dare say of Africa, the problem is simply and squarely one of leadership at all levels. At all levels. Any country you go to, and I visit all of them, most of them, I've visited 50 of them across this continent. Watu wanajiita viongozi hivi. When you hear what they are saying, watu wana piora, piora tu. Maneno machafu tu, viongozi. And they call themselves leaders. Somebody said that we are an agricultural country, are we? When in my rural home we are eating fish from China next to the lake, are we? When we are importing chicken feed from Brazil, are we? 
when the potatoes we are using at Kenchik, Ken which is an American company we import from Egypt, are we agricultural? Are we? When we have no maize, we are importing maize from Brazil and the United States of America of the last seven harvests, which is meant for cows. Are we agricultural? When we are still depending on rain-fed agriculture and we are waiting for little Israel to come and teach us how to irrigate, are we an agricultural country? Complete since 1963 with a Ministry of Agriculture? Leadership. Do we have leadership in health? When our leaders are sick, they are going to South Africa or Dubai or India. And we have been producing doctors since 1970, are we? What is the problem? You'll shortly be going for tea. <laughs> I want you to look at the items that you are consuming there. 50% of them are not from Kenya. Even the paper you are writing on is made in China. Leadership. Uongozi. Ndilo tatizo katika kila mahali. Kama una uongozi basi hakuna popote unapoena. Ndiyo tatizo kubwa la Afrika. Na sisi ambao tunajiita wataalam. <coughs> ah, sisi si wataalam. Sisi ni wataalam uchwara tu. Sisi ni wataalam uchwara tu. If you look at our curriculum that we are using to teach, whether it's in law, whether it's in engineering, whether it's in survey, as I said a little earlier, students in Korea would go to a museum to look at those things. What then is, what, what must we do? How must we train our young leaders? The saying is that if you did not know when the rain started beating you, you would not know when it stopped beating you. We know where it started beating us. As professionals, as a university student, I remember in those younger days, in 1981, the class that was admitted to join the School of Engineering, and there were surveyors, there were only 23 of them. And most of them were actually sponsored by companies. The linkage between industry and the university was intimate. Today, there is no intimacy between industry and universities. Students of electrical engineering were sponsored by Kenya Power and Lighting. I remember the apprentice system, whether in law or in agriculture, I'm being told now, no students want to be enrolled in agriculture. Sometimes you have an, an agriculture graduate who, if you brought a goat and a sheep, he would not know the difference between them because he has never gone to the farm. <laughs> so where do we start? We start with the policy level, policy at the education level, because policy formulation is what gives birth to law. And when you have law, implementation. There is something that... Uh, President Paul Kagame does in Rwanda, which I love. Every other time he brings all his senior officers and he tells them, tell us what you are going to do. And after a while, he brings them back, tell us what you did publicly. And if you doubt me, you go to Kigali, Rwanda, see, I went in Kigali before the genocide and after the genocide, you see what has happened. Leadership that is focused, that makes demand. Leadership by example. We talked about time here through the chair as I conclude. I've had opportunity to serve in three major public institutions. And I don't tell people to come to work at eight. No, I'm in the office at six. When you are in the office at 6 and the official reporting time is 8, people will come at 7. 
Because they say sasa amekuja mkubwa ashakuja asubuhi saa 12 sasa mimi nimechelewa hivi. You are telling people to come at 8 and you are coming at 10. And then you leave after 2 hours. Then you tell them to come. Leadership must be by example. By example, I love what the president of the Republic of Kenya did and said yesterday. He said, "Wewe ni mtu aina gani huyu? Umeandikwa na fedha za umma, waziri, mkuu wa idara umakuja, umechelewa. Una umechelewa ukifanya nini wewe?" The only thing that the president didn't do, which I wish he did, was to stop the individuals immediately. Waende nyumbani huko wakakae, wakachelewe huko. Perhaps it's good to forgive them on day one. But, but you can see that is how you inject discipline into the arena. And the beauty is that I'm talking to you who are leaders in your own right. And each one of you has your own style. But the style of personal example, nothing is greater than that. A leader must be respectful. And I conclude with that. Lazimuheshimu watu. Lazimuheshimu watu ambao unaandika. Ukipata mtu ambaye you know there is a film that I want you to watch is called Gandhi. Is by Sir Richard Attenborough. It dramatizes the life of Mahatma Gandhi. It's the story I tell you then I sit down. And the scene is at the ashram. And on that particular day the wife of the Mahatma has been scheduled to clean the toilets. And she does not. And the Mahatma comes back and asks, why are the toilets not cleaned? Says, but I was scheduled to clean them, I'm your wife. And the Mahatma says, all the more reason. He almost, he almost becomes violent. And then the wife says, Kastuba, there's a book written by, about her called Kastuba. Says, Babuji, I'll clean the toilets. And the Mahatma tells her, you either clean the toilet with joy or not at all. When he was then interviewed by Margaret Bockwright of life, he said, when all is said and done, perhaps the most important person is the toilet cleaner. Have you ever imagined that? You go to the toilet and you expect a clean toilet. All of us. Even when we are here, do you ever think of a person who made it clean? We are going to consume tea here. You expect clean cups. Do you ever imagine who cleaned the cups? Respect to the smallest. He who is greatest amongst you must be your servant. In Africa, leadership is about mwembwe na vingora. Viongozi wakija, mwembwe na vingora. If, if a cabinet Kenyan cabinet minister was enter here, you see an, a bunch of individuals, wide-chested, twice my size, coming and pushing everybody. Unauliza tatizo gani? We have invited the fellow, we are not just about to harm him. But why do we do that? Because we have confused leadership. Mwembe, hizo na vingora, if you is part of the package. They think you are important when uko na mwembe na vingora. Leadership is about simplicity. Simplicity is the highest form of sophistication. You know, as I was coming this morning, I was sitting in seat number 11A. You know, 11A is closest to the business class. So uh, the pastor, in his wisdom, came to extract me. Says, Naomba unifuate tuende kule. Nika mwambia siwezi. Siku lipia. Walio ni alika, wame nilipia hapa. Kama wangetaka niende kule, wange nilipia. Sasa tofauti ya kwamba watanipa taulo moto huko 
na kikombe wakinipa chai huko anatupa viji karatasi tu kama vitu vya vitoto vitoto huko kwa economy and what was the point i was telling that gentleman that i only want what i deserve no favors a leader must be modest you know it pains me when i see government officials between nairobi and mombasa or kisumu all of them in that business class. the only difference in that is a captain no unapewa nani unapewa juice kwa glass ndio tofauti but it is twice the cost to the taxpayer so my fellow brethren it all falls or fails on leadership this continent must be great and it can be great when you look at my paper at the very top of it there is a statement that i've extracted from kwame nkrumah this statement he made in 1957 that africa needs a new man and a new woman who has a stewed greed and whose only desire is to serve Anyerere perhaps put it better in Kiswahili Syria maendeleo ni watu ardhi na siasa safi na vijana wenye malezi bora si hanjema na bongo kali That is what we need And I am now asking you let this not be another jamboree because this country this continent in the next 40 years all of you will be dead Musi kusahau hiyo nyote hata kama mtakuwa bado hai mtakuwa sasa wa kongwe tu not useful to yourself or society that is the reality so when you are doing the right thing think about your children and children's children that is what we must think about because if we don't as i see it now tutatekwa nyara tena tutauzwa tena tutatawaliwa tena god bless you uh, thank you thank you very much uh, 